Amen. Thanks, Josh. Acts chapter 5, we have been reading in our daily Bible reading uh, about the early church. And every time I read the book of Acts, I'm challenged by what God did for this group of believers. We endeavor, I know we come short, uh, but we endeavor uh, to be a church like the church in the book of Acts. We, de we desire to be a biblical New Testament church. And uh, you read this and you think, man, we have so far to go. But, but it is a pattern church. It's a specimen church. One of the things that really challenge, uh, challenges me is the joy that was possessed and demonstrated by these people when things didn't go their way, which was often. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at Acts chapter uh, 5, but in, in this passage, it was, a, it was an account of a time when things did not go their way. They faced some difficulties and endured some severe trials, but when everything was over, guess what? They were still rejoicing, and uh, I... I I want to be that kind of Christian. I come, I come short often. I want our church to be that kind of church uh, where we can rejoice not because everything is easy or convenient or that everything goes our way, but, but we can rejoice because we know who God is and we know he's in control and know he, we know he's working on our behalf. I want you to notice verse 41, if you would, Acts chapter 5, verse 41 the Bible said, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And so what I want us to do tonight is take some time to look back over this chapter. And, and let's see. Now, we know that true joy is found in Jesus alone. And uh, happiness, we can be happy because of what happens to us, but real joy, the root of real joy is a relationship with Jesus. And, uh, and we, but, but there are some things that I see in this chapter that could cause these people to rejoice. And that, uh, the title of the message tonight is Still Rejoicing. Let's jump right into it. Uh, the first thing I, I see in, the, in this church, in this group of people, is I notice the sincerity of the brethren. The chapter starts out <clears throat> with the account of Ananias and Sapphira. I want you to look there with me, if you would, beginning in verse number one. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And, and isn't it amazing what people can conceive in their hearts? Yeah, I, we've, we've been guilty, we, we've all been guilty, where you come up, you concoct this plan in your heart that is wrong, and, and, and you think you're going to get by with it, that I'm going to be able to pull this off, and somehow it's not going to hurt me, it's not going to cost me, it's not going to hurt anyone around me, it, there's going to be no ramifications, no consequences, and we, we conceive all that stuff in our hearts. But, but verse, verse 5 says, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. I reckon so. <laughs> right? Look at verse number 6. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. I don't know. I'm just messed up. That's funny to me. Um, so he, he falls down, he gives up the ghost, he dies. The young men, <clears throat> they got up, <clears throat> they wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter <clears throat> answered unto her, 
tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came out and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. These people were having a bad day. This was a really bad day. In this passage, in this church, what was happening is this was almost like a communal living situation. These people were selling what they had, and they would bring their resources to the apostles, and the apostles would distribute uh, everything so that those who lacked had and those who had gave. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a pretty amazing thing. Well, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they came up with this idea that they were going to sell their land, but they weren't going to give the full price that they got for their land to the church. In other words, this couple pretended to be something that they were not. They were hypocrites. I'll tell you something. This is just one of those things that just strike. It's just kind of funny. Uh, we started doing the mailbox thing for the offering, and we were talking about it. Some of the finance committee guys were uh, last Sunday were up at the office, and we were talking about it. And one of the men said, I'll tell you one thing it's really cut down on, using the, using the uh, mailboxes, the contribution boxes, is we don't get near as many empty envelopes turned in as what we did when we passed the offering plate. I'm just looking for Ananias. He's here somewhere. I don't know where he is. What, what, why, why? That's exactly what this talk about. People, people would put empty envelopes in the plate because they wanted people around them to think they were giving something and there was nothing in them. And Ananias and Sapphira connived this plan in their heart and they, they pretended to be something that they really weren't. They pretended to give something that they really didn't give. One of the greatest hindrances to the work of God moving forward, I believe, are those who profess to be something that they're not. We call them hypocrites or Pharisees. The world just calls them phonies. They just say, yeah, man, that guy's a phony. Now, here, the, the thing that I, I want you to think about is that here is a church that is growing exponentially. Thousands. People are getting saved by the thousands. All right? So, the Bible says that daily, every day, people are getting saved and baptized and being added to this church. So we could, we could say that by now, however many thousands of people are attending this church, and out of all that crowd, there were two who were phonies. They, they, you know what that means? That means that the rest of the brethren were sincere. You know one thing that brings me joy? One thing that brings me great joy as a Christian, as a believer, as a pastor, as a member of this church, I find great joy in, in, in worshiping and serving with a group of people who, by and large, I believe to be very sincere in what they're trying to do. You know, we live in a, we live in a culture today where the insincere people get all the press right? The, the bad guys get all the press. Whether it's a bad doctor or a bad cop or a bad pastor, they are the ones who get all the press. We, we hear stories about pastors who are not genuine. They, they may take advantage of their position for personal gain, or they may commit a crime, or they may lead through intimidation. But for every one of those guys, I can point you to thousands of faithful men of God who lovingly labor for Jesus in their respective places. And you know what? I don't want to ever have my attempt. I don't want my joy 
to be taken from me because I focus on the Ananiases and the Sapphiras and not on the rest of the church. Man, it's a wonderful thing. We're not perfect. It's not a perfect church. It was till you came, but it's not a perfect church. And we don't always do things right. We don't always make the best decisions. And we're not all that we should be. And thank God we're not what we one day will be. But I've been here a long, long time. And you know what I found? There's a lot of sincere people here. And that we can rejoice in that. We can rejoice in the sincerity of the brethren. Number two, we can rejoice in the unity of the believers. Look at verse 12. The Bible says, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. If we go back, and we will, to the previous chapter, look at uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse number 24, if you would. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 24. The Bible said, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ for of a truth. Against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. Here is a group of people and they, God has miraculously gifted them. They're, 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 they're performing miracles through the power of God and, uh, and, and, and these amazing things are happening. But you know what? It, it hit me this week that maybe the greatest miracle that was taking place in this church is that they were in one accord. You know why? Because that's not easy. That's not easy. You go back to Acts chapter 2, and we did recently, and you read about the Parthians and the Medes and all these different nationalities and people from different cultures coming together there on the day of Pentecost, and a mighty move of God, and thousands of people got saved. And you know what they, you know what they started calling them? They didn't, they didn't, they, the Bible doesn't keep referring to them as Medes and and all these different people, you know what it calls them? It calls them Christians. They were believers. And I am so thankful tonight that I get to be a part of a church where we have that kind of unity. And that doesn't mean we never hurt each other or disappoint each other or let one another down. It doesn't mean that we never shortchange one another. But what it means is somehow, somehow, we have managed to get several hundred people from all over this community of all different types of backgrounds. You understand, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but you understand, the media and government is trying to divide us. That's, that, that's the bottom line. They're, they're trying to divide us. They'll use anything. They'll use anything. They, 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 they could care less. Anything to cause division is their goal. And, and, and you know what? With some people, it works. With some people, it works. Uh, look, listen to me. And I know I, I've said this and said this and said this and said this and said this. But you and I are not going to divide over a vaccine or over a mask or over you you and I are not you and I are not going to divide if we divide over skin color that's going to be your choice it's not going to be mine it's not going to be mine i told my class this morning and it, just being just being really forthright with you Man, every time I, I hear, I read another news story where they're trying to divide and they're trying to uh, cause contention between races, you know what? I just find myself going out, man, when I see anybody who doesn't look just like me, I try to be really, really nice to them. Amen. That's right. 
You know why? Because I want them to know. Man, I love them. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a part of that mess. I refuse to be a part of that mess. And, and here we are in a local New Testament church, and God has allowed us, in, in this situation, evidently there was no jealousy, no envy, no jockeying for position. There was a spirit of unity and cohesiveness that was just a joy and so Christ honoring. Psalm 133, verse 1, great and powerful scripture. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And we can rejoice tonight. Not a perfect church by no stretch of anyone's imagination, but God's given us a really good spirit. And I'm thankful for that. So I can rejoice in the unity of the believers, the sincerity of the brethren. Number three, we can rejoice in the expansion of our influence. Look, if you would, at verse 14, chapter 5. We're moving along pretty quick. Chapter 5, verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Verse 16, there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, <clears throat> and they were healed, every one. You know what God was doing with this church? Let me tell you what God was doing. He was broadening their influence. Man, when you have so much influence that people think that your shadow has power, that's, that's some influence. And I was, as I was reading that just now, you know what the thought hit me? That it wasn't very long ago when these guys had tucked tail and run because Jesus was being crucified. We want, hey, Peter, we're going to lay our sick children in the street, and maybe when you pass by, maybe, just maybe, your shadow will touch them. Well, it wasn't long ago, this guy was cussing yeah. That's right. because he was afraid that someone was going to think he was a Christian. Yeah. Right. And now, in just a matter of days, God has broadened his influence. Verse 13 says, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. So the influence of the apostles was increasing as people magnified them or esteemed them very highly. When you consider influence, this is about as good as it gets. Yeah. They're going out. The Bible's clear. They're going out, but, but people are coming to them. Wouldn't it be something if next Sunday at 1030, wouldn't it be something if this room just filled to, the, to capacity and we had to turn people away and, 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 and we would say, how did you find out about us? Man, everybody knows about you. Man, everybody's heard what's going on here. Man, we just, we, we just feel like if we could be here, it would be in our best interest that, that we, would, we would be enriched. We would be helped. That's what's happening right here. Their, their influence is expanding. Do you know, what? as I think about ministry, and I think about what we're trying to do for the Lord here, I, 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 boy, I want God to expand our influence. Not so that we can make a name for ourselves, but so that we can let others know about His name. And, and, and every time, every time uh, we... Every time we add another missionary to our missions program, you know what we're doing? We're expanding our influence. That's what we're doing. Every time that you go out these doors into this community and you represent Jesus the way he ought to be represented, we're expanding our influence. We get criticized, independent Baptists get criticized, and, and maybe rightly so in some cases, of being so possessed and driven by numbers, but you know what? I'd rather have 500 people going out of here representing Jesus than, than 400. You know why? Because that broadens our influence. By the way, influence is not just a church thing. Mom and dad, you have influence. God has given you influence. 
teachers, you have influence, and, 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 and uh, those who serve in the academy or the daycare, or whether you're a coach or a grandma or a grandpa, if someone looks to you for insight or direction, you should rejoice in that. Man, I get to touch someone's life. I get to influence someone, not to bring them to myself, but to point them to the Savior. So they were able to rejoice in the expansion of their influence. Number four, they were able to rejoice because of the deliverance of the Lord. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is, of the, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Verse 18. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Verse 19. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, it goes on, the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors. You know what, you know what we can rejoice tonight? We can rejoice about the deliverance of the Lord. There are people all over this room, and I won't, I won't embarrass you, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, who before you met Jesus lived a life of of slavery, a life of addiction. You lived a life in bondage. And you know what? He delivered you. Amen. He delivered you. Yes. All of us. The Bible tells us that all of us were servants to sin yeah. before Jesus. What did he do? He delivered us. Amen. He delivered us. And we can rejoice tonight in the fact that we have been delivered. Go to Psalm 103. Hold your place in Acts. And go to the 103rd Psalm. The 103rd Psalm. And look with me, if you would, at verse number 2. This is a great chapter. Uh, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Verse, verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? Who healeth all thy diseases? Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles? You, you know, you just read on down through this chapter and again and again, you read about a God who just keeps working on behalf of his people whenever they are in a time of need, and we can rejoice tonight. By the way, the same God who did deliver us and has delivered us, He will continue to deliver us. And when we look at this, these perilous times, we look at these perilous times, and we we have to we have to have we have to have some apprehension, right? We say, man, what in the world? But can I tell you, God is going to deliver His people. He will deliver his people. So we rejoice in the deliverance of the Lord quickly. Number five, we rejoice that we have a mandate from God. I like this. They are allowed, uh, they're delivered from prison. So they went to the temple to preach. That's what they were told to do. Look at verse number 27. And when they had brought them, they, <clears throat> they went to the temple. The, the Lord said, go to the temple and preach. So the officers came and and uh, they found them, and they, 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 well, they didn't find them. They were not in the prison. And they went back, and they said, well, the prison's all shut up tight. Uh, but when we opened it up, we couldn't find anyone. And uh, someone said, well, they're down at the temple. Look at verse number 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold... Ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles, we hear this verse a lot in this day and hour, answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Do you know one thing that we can rejoice about? Listen, listen. We have been given a mandate from God. We, God has given, what we are doing tonight, what you do at your home, if you're trying to raise your children according to the word of God, you have been given a biblical mandate. Do you understand that that is a big deal? <clears throat> that, that, that's a huge deal. That the God of heaven has said to us, this is how I want you to live. 
And this is what I want you to do. And serving God and reaching people is all a part of that. Uh, Verse 29 Peter, uh, we read it. He said we ought to obey God rather than men. So, so all of this outside pressure is being put upon them, but the apostles recognize pressure from someone much higher than a high priest or a captain. And, and Peter said, sir, with all due respect, you have been trumped. I have been given a mandate from the God of heaven. And at the end of the day, sir, when your order contradicts his order, I'm going to acquiesce to a higher power. And I'm going to obey the Lord. I'm I'm going to obey the Lord. Do you know the work of God is the most exciting work in the world? It really is. We are ambassadors for Christ. Hey, don't be discouraged, church. The state of culture and society today does nothing but increase our opportunity and our potential effectiveness. Why? Well, the darker the night, the brighter the light, right? Well, it's getting dark. And and we sit here today and we realize that, man, I, as a child of God, have been left here in this world to represent Jesus. Everywhere you go, everywhere you go. I mentioned it recently, but... Oftentimes in coaching, you say to kids, if we're going to win this game, we can't take a play off, okay? We've got to defend every time they come to our basket, and we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to cherish the ball. We can't turn the ball. We can't take a play off. Listen to me. Today, we cannot take a play off. It's not enough for you to walk in here and, and, and put on the air of being a Christian. We've got to leave this room. You got to go to your house, to your place of residence, to your school, to where you work. You can't take a playoff. Hey, God needs people representing Him tomorrow. Amen. He's given us a mandate. If you go out to eat tonight after church, you're to represent Jesus Christ in that restaurant. Amen. Why? He's given you a mandate. That's why. When you clock in tomorrow, you clock in, you be on time. And you work hard and you fulfill your obligation and you do what a Christian ought to do. Why? Because you've been given a mandate to do that. God said, I send you, I send you into the world to represent me. We've been given a mandate from God. Number six, we can rejoice tonight. We're almost done about the conviction of the Spirit. You know what Peter did? Peter cut loose preaching. Look at verse 30. Acts chapter 5, verse number 30. Peter said, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on the tree. They didn't like that. But that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Look at verse 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. So, man, he just cuts loose. I mean, both barrels. He just says, hey, you guys, you crucified the Savior of the world. That's what happened. God gave his son, and you hung him on a tree. Well, what was the response? Look at the next verse. Look at verse number 33. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart. I like that phrase. I don't know all that it means, but I'll tell you what I think it means. I think it means they were convicted by the Holy Spirit. You know, I want to rejoice tonight that while we try to do the Lord's work on the outside, He is doing His work on the inside. We, we had people this morning who heard the Word of God, were convicted by the Spirit of God, and responded to an invitation saying, I want to trust Christ. I, I, put, I said something this, this afternoon on, on my Facebook page. I said, you know, I, I felt like the Holy Spirit met with us in a tangible way this morning. Yes. I know he's always here. If two or three are here, he's here, right. right? But sometimes it's a little more tangible. And sometimes you're able to say, you know, I really sense the Spirit of the Lord this morning. Yes. Sometimes 
you and I hear preaching, and it cuts to our heart, and it convicts us. And, and, and when we yield to that, instead of resisting that, that's how God allows us to grow as Christians. When you come to a place where God cuts at your heart and you refuse to change, you are stunting your, spirit, your own spiritual growth. You, you, are, you are assassinating yourself spiritually. Man, I'm glad. I'm glad that I can be in a church where the Spirit of God still works. And I, I'm glad where I can hear music and the Spirit of God speaks to me. I, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that. Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. You know what he said in this account of the Great Commission? Hey, you go out and you do the work of God, but don't do it without his power. Don't do it without his power. Why? Because that's what's going to cut to the heart. And then the last thing, we can rejoice because we have a purpose that is worthy. We have a purpose that's worthy. Look at verse 34. Verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And he said unto them, ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. I love this. For before these days rose up Thutis, Theudas, Ted. How you like that? That's pretty good, wasn't it? Boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who was slain and and, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. And this man rose up, Judas of Galilee, in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, hey guys, listen to me, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it'll come to naught. But if it be of God... You cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, what? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. You know why we can rejoice tonight? We can rejoice because, because our, the cause that we are giving ourselves to is a worthy cause. Amen. That's why we can rejoice. People, I'm done preaching, people throughout history have given themselves to, to causes of much less importance. People give themselves to, to things. You know, it's funny, every... Every kid thinks he's, he's going to play in the NBA. I, I've watched through the years a lot of people give themselves to silly and trivial pursuits. Only to find at some point that the cause really wasn't worthy. But one day, one day. We're going to stand before him. Yes. We're going to be in his presence. Yes. One day, you know, what I, you know what I believe? From this pulpit to the back row to the top of the balcony, you know what I believe? One day, when we, stand, when we see him, what we're going to say is, he was worthy Amen. of so much more yes. than what I gave. Yes. So much more. We have a cause that's worthy. Oh, man, there's all kinds of causes today. People give themselves. By the way, just so you know how I feel about it, there ain't no such thing as Mother Nature. There is a Father God. And people give themselves. I told you, I was... I was, we were driving in one Sunday, and we, we went that day. We went a different way. We were kind of Comill Road. And all of a sudden, traffic 
traffic backed up. And, and, and I looked. I can't remember now. Was it ducks or a turtle? Do you remember? We're getting old. We don't remember nothing. But this, this guy had stopped in the middle of Coal Mill Road. You know, that's not a private drive. He's got his flashers on, and he got out, and I can't remember whether it was a turtle or a giraffe. It was one of the two. <laughs> I always get confused. But he stopped. I, I think it was a turtle. And he went, and he picked that turtle up, and he carried it out, left his kids sitting in a car in the middle of Coal Mill Road. And took, people give their lives. We were going down New Sharon Church Road one night. It was raining cats and dogs. And this cat kept stopping in front of me. I mean, it was one of those torrential rains. This was in the last six months or so. And, and I, I kept trying to pass him, but there was cars coming. I couldn't get around him. And finally, he pulls off the road. Well, I couldn't tell it was a he until I got out. I got out. It was pouring rain. I thought, this is, this is some poor lady, and she's having car trouble. And I got out, and I pulled over on the side of the road, put my flashers on, and raining like crazy. And I went back, and, I, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a guy in his 20s, two guys. And I said, can I help you? He said, we're just rescuing salamanders. Lizards. Man, can I tell you tonight, the cause tonight is not Fellowship Baptist Church. The cause tonight is not old-fashioned fundamentalism. The cause tonight is Christ. And he's worthy. I don't know what you gave in the offering today, but he's worthy. I don't know how much time you invested this week but he's worthy. I don't know what sacrifices you'll make in your life to further his cause, but I promise you, I promise you, when you stand one day and you see him, you know what you're going to say? I wish I'd given him more. We can rejoice. Hey, you get it? This is big league stuff right here. This is big leagues. They, they drive by, they drive by, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Don't even pay attention. Look over here, see the cars, think, what's wrong? Those crazy religious people, what they don't know, this is as important as it gets. Tonight, can I ask you a question? Are you a joyful Christian? That's funny, isn't it? We read the verse, they rejoiced, and they had just gotten the dickens beat out of them. But they rejoiced. They rejoiced. Father, I pray you'd help us. Just, I'm just going to stop. I, I pray you would help us to realize what a blessing it is to be a part of the family of God. What a blessing it is to get to serve and worship you in a local church. Thank you, Lord, that you have surrounded us with some very sincere people. Not perfect people, but very genuine people. God, remind us often, remind us often that we are blessed and highly favored, that we get to represent you in this world. We have been given a biblical mandate to live for you and to share you with others. God, I want to thank you tonight, and I rejoice in the fact that the Spirit of God still convicts my heart and preaching and and, and even reading your word. Oftentimes, the Spirit of God cuts to my heart, and I want to rejoice in that. Lord, I pray you would help us. Our heads.